let me lay out a few things as to why we're so confident historically uh, fr- from, a, uh, from a, a scholarly viewpoint that Jesus lived and died and rose from the dead. Ooh, from a scholarly viewpoint, I'd better get my mortar board. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. Michael L. Brown is best known... No. Some Jew gets nailed to a cross. I don't know, a thousand who gives a shit years ago. No, not that. <laughs> that sarcasm, isn't it? Uh, best known as the host of a nationally syndicated radio show called Line of Fire. He has a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Literature from New York University and is a unique voice in the apologetic sphere as a Messianic Jew and Christian Zionist. Someone on Twitter alerted me to this video and wished for Dr. Brown and I to have a conversation about it. I can confirm that Michael was offered a popular platform to chat with me, but he turned me down. While I'd have loved for that to happen, I think the methodology of this prominent figure deserves our attention and evaluation. So let's take a look. The first thing is that the New Testament documents are the the most wonderfully preserved documents from the ancient world. I'm not sure that wonderfully preserved is a measurable category to declare a winner. What is a unit of preservation? You have things about ancient Roman history and ancient Greek history, and the only manuscripts we have are from hundreds and hundreds of years later. This is true. Sometimes the earliest copies of things we have are from hundreds of years later. So historians hold them more tentatively than works with earlier attestation. They apportion confidence according to the level of evidence. And sometimes they're only a handful. This is true. Same point applies. With the New Testament, the earliest manuscripts are within a generation of the death of the the authors of the New Testament. That's kind of unprecedented. It's not only unprecedented, it's false. The earliest manuscripts are not within a generation of the death of the authors. Typically, when someone in modern day uses generation as a length of time, they mean 30 years or so. I'm happy to use 40 years to be generous to Dr. Brown, but it's worth noting that a first century generation was much closer to 20 years. For Acts, 2 Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Philemon, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation, the earliest manuscripts are from the 3rd or 4th centuries. As I've yet to hear a Christian claim that any of these men lived to 260 years old, Dr. Brown is just wrong about these. Scholars don't claim to know who wrote Hebrews, so that can't be tested. Assuming that Paul wrote all the letters attributed to him, the earliest manuscripts of those letters are most generously dated around 175 AD. Since Christian tradition has Paul dying around 64 AD, that's at least three generations away best case. If we accept the earliest dating, we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke fragments from around 150 AD. However, Christian tradition for these men has them martyred in the mid-first century, so these are at least two generations away. This leaves the Gospel of John, Dr. Brown's best case. It's widely accepted that manuscript fragment P52, a credit card-sized bit of the Gospel of John, is the earliest extant copy that has been discovered. It's 2nd century, but when in the 2nd century? 175 AD to 200 AD is commonly argued. A few outlying scholars have put forth 125 AD. So, if John was the author of John, and the church tradition that John died of old age around 90 AD, and the fringe position on the dating of P52 is correct, then Dr. Brown would be just barely correct about one book if we generously call a generation 40 years. One book out of 27 books is not the impression Dr. Brown gives here. This is incredibly misleading at best and bordering on dishonest or uninformed. It's ultimately irrelevant, but why stretch the truth like this if you're trying to convince people about the strong scholarly evidence of your position? I went on this one a bit at length, to demonstrate the kind of sloppy claims Dr. Brown will be throwing around today. And we have thousands of manuscript copies. The number of manuscript copies tells us nothing at all about the veracity of what's written and only the popularity of what's written. That said, from the first thousand years of Christianity, 
we have only a few hundred manuscripts. We don't start getting into thousands of copies until you start including those from the 12th century. And even though between them there are tiny copyist errors and things like that, and, and you know, one thing would spell Mr. M-I-S-T-E-R and another M-R dot, the, the, the fact is they're in essential harmony on all the foundations. Dr. Brown is downplaying the magnitude here. There are more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. But the hundreds of thousands of differences are the inevitable product of so many human-made copies. I concede that most are in the category of spelling and other easily identified copying errors. But a few are more concerning. A topic for another day. That's amazing. So it's the best attested book from the ancient world. It appears that Dr. Brown is equating number of copies with attestation. There are far fewer variations in our 600 ancient copies of Homer's Iliad, for example. Why isn't that better attested? But for the official book of the official religion of the largest empire to have been the work that most resources went toward copying is entirely unsurprising and certainly not requiring anything divine to explain. However, it should go without saying that how well a claim has been preserved has less than nothing to do with whether the claim is true. Otherwise, we'd see kids in London train stations disappearing to Hogwarts. Not only so, but scholars have seen that the accounts we have in the Gospels are eyewitness accounts. Well, now you're getting to a sharp divide between secular historians and evangelical apologists. None of the Gospel authors claim to be eyewitnesses. Church tradition agrees that the authors of Luke and Mark were not eyewitnesses. An eyewitness wrote John, only if you interpret the author as referring to himself in the third person. George is getting upset! And if Matthew wrote Matthew, rather than telling the story of his personal first time meeting Jesus in his own words, he decided instead to copy verbatim his experience from Mark's telling. If someone asks you to tell the story of how you met your spouse, you don't copy and paste the description from the wedding toast your sister gave. And Luke talked to the eyewitnesses. The author of Luke doesn't claim to have personally spoken to eyewitnesses. He says that the stories he's recording were handed down from eyewitnesses. This could mean second-hand tales. This could mean fifth-hand or twentieth-hand telephone games. To assume a best-case scenario is purely an assumption. And researched and got the information to get things accurate. So... It's not like, say, Muhammad, hundreds and hundreds of years later, claiming to get revelation from God and telling us what happened in Jesus' day or telling us what happened in Moses' day. These were the eyewitnesses. What eyewitness told the authors of the gospel about what Jesus prayed in private in the garden? Or what Satan told Jesus? Or what the guards said to each other in private? Or what God was doing before creation? These details were allegedly inspired by the Holy Spirit. How is that revelation from God any different from that of Muhammad. And there's even something called the criterion of embarrassment. In other words, if something in the document is embarrassing to the, to the hero of the story, you don't expect to see it. The criterion of embarrassment is used almost exclusively in biblical apologetics, with only rare appeals from secular historians. This is, in part, because it is impossible to have confidence that what would be embarrassing in one time or place or individual would also be embarrassing for another time or place or individual. Times change. Cultural norms vary by region. Equally importantly, it is clear that people will be willing to be embarrassed if that is in service of another goal. For example, to convince someone of the truth of a lie. But I will now prove this murder could not have been committed by my client, Mr. Chad, Kevin Jeremy. Now, the following texts were all sent between 1041 and 1051 p.m. to various female recipients. We have, you up? Hey, you. What up? You out? Another one, you out? Another, you out? Were these your texts? Yes, they were. Further proof that my client was in no mood for murder. Old case detective and evangelical Christian apologist J. Warner Wallace, recently threw water on this one. This to me looked like, the, the, that principle we talk about of embarrassment, I've known some guys who, who would include 
embarrassing things in their lie. I have known guys who do in that. order to be perceived. Yeah, because as... they want to be more persuasive with yeah. me. So it's not as though it's not possible. When you read the ancient accounts of the great heroes of old, the mythological accounts, that they don't have the blemishes and the faults, and yet. These eyewitness accounts tell you all the failings of the disciples. Why would you do that if you're launching a movement? Talk about all the flaws and failings of the disciples. Any number of literary reasons, but not the least of which is to act as a proxy in the life of Jesus for the gospel reader, the so-called audience surrogate, normal characters in abnormal situations who can ask the questions that the audience would naturally ask or feel the way the audience would naturally feel. How did you know? Did you see his watch? His watch? Time is right, but the date was wrong. Who are the people? Projections of my subconscious. Yours? Yes. And that's bad, yeah? That doesn't cover it. It's also entirely possible that the gospel writers weren't huge fans of the original 12 disciples. If disparate traditions are to be believed, all but John were dead by the time most scholars agree the gospels were written. You did say this was to be from a scholarly viewpoint, didn't you? As far as outside sources, outside sources, remember, this was not like today. You didn't have people with cell phones reporting immediately. You didn't have people tweeting stuff out. This is a little condescending. Twitter was founded in 2006. It might end in 2023. Who knows? Do you think we skeptics have so little concept of first century historical context that we're going to be confused on this? Or is this side topic a method of trying to get people to lower their standard of evidence? You didn't have CNN with 24-hour news. We didn't even have CNN when I was a kid. Don't start doing math. News. So the historians wouldn't write about things in their own day, the great historians of old. They would generally wait, and then they would look back at the earlier days and write their histories about what happened. Some did, but others wrote contemporaneously. Julius Caesar wrote or dictated his commentaries on his role in the Gaelic War. Alexander the Great had historian Callisthenes, along with some of his generals, recording his campaigns as they happened. First century Jewish Roman historian Josephus wrote about events taking place during his lifetime, and on and on. There are countless documents from the time period of people recording recent events or transactions, none of which included Jesus. But Dr. Brown would protest. Those are not historians because they're not writing about the ancient past. If your definition of historian is someone writing about the ancient past, of course historians write only about the ancient past. So when we begin to have attestation of Jesus dying, or this one called Christ, they didn't, some didn't know what to make of the name, with him dying. If Jesus lived, it's trivial to accept that he died. Everyone dies. And, and then reports of his resurrection or his early followers being devoted to him and willing to die for him. Many are willing to die for a person or a cause. Being willing to die for a belief just means you really believe it. If Dr. Brown wants to suggest that early followers were in a position to know that their beliefs were true, he's going to have to start naming names and showing documentation. Which followers saw a risen Jesus? And how do we know they were willing to die for this claim? What evidence do we have? This is church tradition, not documented fact. You have the outside sources, the outside Greek and Roman sources. You even have outside Jewish sources that attest to Jesus dying. Again, if Jesus lived, then Jesus died. It's the rising part I'm skeptical of. Even Jewish leadership giving him over to die at the time of the Passover. Dr. Brown is referring to the Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin 43a, which says, On the eve of Passover, they hanged Yeshu. But this is from around 500 AD. So this is hardly independent corroboration. It's just a retelling of the claim already made for hundreds of years. So these are non-believing sources, some of them hostile, yet they report the same essential truths, the foundations of our faith. Check out my detailed video on secular sources for Jesus. Unlike Dr. Brown, I go into each one and evaluate what they add to the picture. Surprisingly little. And, and not only so, the idea that in ancient Rome, you would start a new religion where your founder dies a criminal's death, that was a scandal, 
a scandal of all scandals. Explain to me how this would be a scandal. Then, to the Jewish world, expecting a Messiah who would rule and reign to preach this, these were stumbling blocks. You don't invent that. Why not? It seems to have resonated with millions and billions of people, none of whom actually saw risen Jesus. If it was invented, it was effective. And you don't invent a virgin birth. That's exactly the kind of thing you'd invent to link your dead figurehead to a divine origin. Uh, you find me another religion where the founder comes from a virgin birth. There are plenty of worshipped gods out there who are said to be the offspring of a god and a mortal. Making an artificial distinction between these and yours, based on a virginity criteria, is completely arbitrary and post hoc. A pregnant virgin? And then if the whole thing is a myth... A whole thing doesn't need to be a myth. The whole thing could be a legend that grew out of kernels of historical truth. You don't die for it. You're not tortured to death for it because you know the whole thing is a myth. Again, Dr. Brown, please provide the names of the people you're referring to who were eyewitnesses, later tortured, and were given a chance to survive if they recanted. I've been studying this for a while now, and I'm unaware of even a single person who confidently matches that description. I think there's also been a hyper-trust by many Christians who read fathers and says, hey, they all died as martyrs, and they proclaim it. Well, I've made that claim in the past, so I repent on this show from making that before I did my research. That should be corrected as well. So all of these things are, are looked at just in an academic, serious way so that people say, yeah, the evidence would say that Jesus existed, that he was known for healings and exorcisms. But when was he known for these things? After the second century, when the legends had grown? Sure. But he may not have been known for these things during his lifetime. And, of course, even Dr. Brown would agree that not everyone known for healing and exorcisms have honestly done such things. Uh, that he died? That his followers claimed that he rose from the dead? Yes, his post-death followers eventually made this claim. We don't know what his pre-death followers said or thought. All we know is that people were eventually convinced. People are convinced of false things every day. None of these things have ever happened in this way with any other religion. Again, to put your religion in a special category for arbitrary criteria is post hoc rationalization. False religions happen all the time, and the process is generally indistinguishable from Christian proliferation. Especially with eyewitness testimony. Maybe you should have spent more of the video convincing us that you have eyewitness testimony. And then there's the last thing. There's the prophetic word. The prophetic word. You say, well, how do we know he's born in Bethlehem? Prophet said so, but how do we know it happened? We could argue about that. We could. I don't have any reason to think that he was born in Bethlehem. Two gospel authors record two very different stories to try to explain how the man known to be from Nazareth was secretly born in Bethlehem after all. How do we know he was a miraculous birth? We could argue about that. That's pretty much for the Bible tells me so. But the prophets also indicated in the Old Testament that the Messiah would be rejected by his own people and then would be received by the Gentile world. Being rejected by your people and accepted by others is a tediously common story. It applies to me. It applies to Weird Al Yankovic. He's definitely not proud of you. What? Yes, he told me to be crystal clear about that. Also, he still thinks the parody songs are stupid, and I don't have to tell you how he feels about the accordion, do I? Okay, well, Mom, I actually have to go now. Before his own people would receive him back, and that he had to come and die before the Second Temple was destroyed. So how do you plan that out? How do you make that happen? Second Temple was destroyed in 70 AD. How do you make these things happen? I'm planning some detailed videos on various alleged prophecies about Jesus, but suffice to say that I find these Second Temple passages to fail any test one can put forth of making clear predictions with clear fulfillment. One way to make these things happen is for legends of fulfillment to grow to accommodate. Or another is to retroactively interpret vague prophecy in light of desired endpoints. All the evidence says what the New Testament tells us really happened. As always, it comes down to, or the Bible tells me so. So not only are we sure in our hearts, 
we're sure in our minds also. If you want to hear more of my case against the resurrection, tap on the playlist on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Later. <laughs>